Roto Grinders NFL Food for Thought Podcast. Another week. I am the Luch here with Will Priester, Chief Justice 06. What's up, Chief? Nothing much, brother. Another week. Another slate in the books. Another slate ahead. Uh, this is uh, th- this might be a podcast for the ages this week. Uh, for all the listeners, listeners, welcome aboard. Uh, this should be a good podcast. I- I'll keep it at that until we actually get in there. This should be a good podcast. Thanks for tuning in, folks. We appreciate you. I cannot believe we are heading into week 10. And this past weekend was no disappointment of exciting, fun NFL action. Some really intriguing things. Some other disappointing things. Nonetheless, we have a lot to unpack here. And we'll start off with our elephant in the room segment. And I will throw it over to you wherever you would like to start. People that are tuning in, that are weekly followers, probably know exactly where this is going. Aaron Rodgers sucks. Let, let's just get it out of the way right now. I, I'm turning up early. Like, if you've been listening to this podcast, I've been trying to get people on the non-Aaron Rodgers train of him being actually good anymore. Now, look, I'm going to give him a pass. He's getting older. What is he, 40 years old now, 39 years old? I'm going to give him a pass. He's getting older. Father time is undefeated. But you can't gripe and complain and whine and say, hey, pay me my $50 million a year. Give me what's due. And then go into Detroit of all places and throw interceptions in the red zone back to back. One being a terrible INT fading away off a back leg to an offensive lineman that was wide open. And literally, the guy just runs under and says, yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks for being terrible. Give me the ball. This game ended up, folks, it was a 15-9 game. Aaron Rodgers threw for over 300 yards, and the Green Bay Packers could only put together nine points. Now, here's my question. Well, here's my my, uh, uh, soliloquy, if you will. Yeah, we're going to say Aaron Rodgers did everything he could to win this game. Yeah, he also did everything he could to lose this game. Two interceptions in the red zone early. Meanwhile, Jared Goff's throwing for like 112, 120, and they win this game. Aaron Rodgers handed the Lions points or, or possessions, if you will, in the red zone. Like, okay, it's one thing if you throw one up. And it's like a punt. It's another thing when you're inside the 20, inside the 10, and you're a veteran quarterback that's supposed to be good, that's supposed to be able to lead this team. You can't blame these young receivers on throwing interceptions in the red zone because that's what we've been saying, right? Oh, it's the young receivers. He doesn't have any help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blame Matt LaFleur on this one as well. I, I don't know why he didn't just run the ball half the game and let Aaron Rodgers sit back there and chill this game. No, you went into Detroit. Aaron Aaron wants to be the hero, and he turns out to be a zero in this game. You cannot get your season back on track losing to the Detroit Lions, knowing you have to play the Cowboys the next week. How many? Raise your hands virtually if you think the Green Bay Packers are going to beat the Cowboys. Nobody's raising their hand because they know already the Packers aren't winning this game. It's it's terrible, and we've given Aaron Rodgers all the praise for all of these years, and now that he sucks, we want to give him a pass. Folks, he's been sucking the whole time. He can't put together winning seasons. I don't care if he won the MVP. Get me the championships, okay? That's what this is about. If you want to be one of the greats, get the championships. Why is Dan Marino, as many stats as he put up, why is he not in the same stratosphere as the greats? He doesn't have the championships. So Aaron Rodgers, maybe I've been a bit overcritical by calling him awful, but he's definitely outside of the championship rung of quarterback. If you didn't have coffee this morning, you got a jolt here, that's for sure. So he puts together winning seasons. He just doesn't win the season. Exactly. 
for a player exactly. of his magnitude for the pedestal we want to. That's what I'm saying. The guy has many winning seasons, though. It's a bad combination in Green Bay all around. You have an aging Aaron Rodgers. In my opinion, you kind of have an inept head coach who's getting bailed out by a very winnable division and a quarterback who's very good, depending on who you ask. Maybe he's not elite, but the division had many win- win- like winnable games for many years between the state of the Lions. There's two gimmies every year except this year. The Vikings have been up and down. The Bears haven't been good for, geez, you know, we're pushing seven, eight years pretty much already. And here we are. And you get smoked. Okay, you don't get smoked by the Lions, but anytime the Lions beat the Packers, the state of the franchise is not good. You have no help at wide receiver. I'm not bailing your boy out here. But the entire network of hands that need to be working together is not working at all. And no, they haven't brought help in via the draft before this season. To get him any damn help. Devontae Adams left. That was a big blow. You have two rookie receivers. Dobbs was capable Not ready to be a number one. Maybe he never will be. And he got hurt. And that's really sad and unfortunate. And we wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, Christian Watson's not ready either to to step into a prominent role. So the Packers. The Packers are going to miss the playoffs, Chief. It's a fact. Like, these are the facts. The Packers aren't going to the playoffs. I don't they're not gonna have a better record than the than the Chicago Bears. I don't think. Um they're definitely not gonna have a better record than than the Vikings, even though the Vikings are about to actually be in a tough stretch of games. They're not gonna have a better rec- record than the Vikings. And heck, who knows? They can't even beat the Detroit Lions at this point. I, I don't I don't even think I think we just have zero expectations for the Packers at this point this season. And let's just leave it at that. Like, I'm shocked Aaron Rodgers didn't just throw in the towel at halftime and retire. I mean, what what else what else is he going to accomplish? What what other team is even willing to take him on outside of his name value? Of course, of course, he could very well end up a Carolina Panther next year. I, I'm kidding. I, I doubt it. Uh, but my point is he, he's surviving off name value right now. That that's what this is. And guess what? Tom Brady surviving off name value too. But the difference is Tom Brady went out there and won a game. And he did help them win that game by manufacturing a 44-second uh, game-winning drive. Like, that, like that's all I'm saying, right? If, if Aaron Rodgers was helping this team actually win games, I wouldn't be so critical on him this season. Do you, do you understand? Because I've seen Tom Brady go out there and not have the weapons but still win games. I've seen Peyton Manning not actually have the arm strength to be an NFL quarterback but still go out there and win games. You get what I'm saying? So that's okay. I've seen Eli Manning maybe not be as talented as some of these other guys but go out and win games. I've seen Drew Brees have a have a, a a decline in his skill level over the years, but still go out here and win games. I've seen Ben Roethlisberger with hurt knees, hurt elbows, hurt ankles go out here and win games. I've seen Michael Vick play for the Atlanta Falcons, be one of the most electric quarterbacks in football, have a dogfight incident, come back and play for the Eagles, and go out here and win games. So. When, you, when you're asking me about where does Aaron Rodgers rank on my totem pole, this is why I'm not on the Aaron Rodgers train because I've seen other great quarterbacks still get it done with limited ability and limited, limited talent around them and controversy and all these other things. So I don't want to hear it about Aaron Rodgers anymore. The, a loss to the Detroit Lions in one of the worst seasons this organization has had is all I need to put the nail in the coffin. If you're not winning against the Detroit Lions when they're bad too and have been the scum of the division since their existence, 
Like, your, your time is over. I'm done. Collectively, the team's just not very talented either. A lot of those quarterbacks you mentioned had a consistently better supporting cast around them, though. A lot of those names you mentioned. Aaron Rodgers did have that for quite some time, though. And, you know, I'm just circling around your point, weaving around a couple of them here. But it kind of felt like that Lions game was like a microcosm. Is that a word? Uh, a <laughs> snippet. I don't, I don't know. A snippet of his career. How, you know, like, where are the rest of the rings, you know? You always say win another championship. Green Bay had 350 yards, averaged over five and a half yards of play. Converted over 50% of their third downs. One time of possession by like 10 minutes. Couldn't get the job done. Doesn't that just feel like losing in the NFC Championship time after time and time again, Chief? That loss kind of encapsulates. I'm making up words now. You got to love it. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But (laughs) Green Bay did everything they had to do to win that game except win the game Sunday is what I'm getting at here. Okay. Now, I would agree with you. I would agree with you if these things did not happen. Oh, Aaron Rodgers cost them three turnovers. Aaron Rodgers throws two in the red zone, three interceptions overall. Now, quarterbacks are going to throw interceptions, and I understand that. But my point is, as as many stats, and, and see, here's where I'm going, Luch. I've been saying this. Aaron Rodgers can put up some stats, but where are the wins? Where, Aaron Rodgers for MVP. Okay, great. Where, where are the championships? Aaron Rodgers takes this team to the NFC Championship. Where are the Super Bowl appearances? This is my point, and this has been my point the whole time. If you're going to be put on the pedestal, and be in the same stratosphere as the greats, the production and the and the other things need to line up with the with the pedestal that you've been afforded the opportunity to have in the National Football League. And Aaron Rodgers has taken that pedestal and done nothing with it but achieve regular season success. And this year he doesn't even have that. And so guess what's happening now? The legend of Aaron Rodgers is exposed. And it's and it's it's exposed right before your very eyes. Once again, I'm, I'm comparing him to these great quarterbacks because this is what we've done from the beginning of time. That is why I'm so critical of Aaron Rodgers. It has nothing to do with how I feel about him personally. It's got everything to do with how I feel that he measures up versus some of the other all-time greats. Now, Drew Brees only has one championship. Right? Aaron Rodgers only has one. So if I want to be critical of Aaron, I'm going to be critical of Drew as well. But what are the differences? Drew Brees doesn't whine and complain and talks bad about the coach and talk. You see what I'm saying? It's it's so it's it's all these things working together. And so if this is going to be your personality that you present to the media and you present to everyone else, then we've got to judge you accordingly. And so if you're going to be a jerk in front of the camera, I'm going to be a jerk on the camera and call you out and say that you've had a crappy attitude and now you're not even winning games. Get him some weapons. He doesn't have any weapons. Here come the he doesn't have any weapons truthers, right? Like they're coming out of the woodworks. Here's what happens. But those weapons didn't cost them that game. You see what I'm saying? Like, in the NFL, you can't have t- three turnovers and expect to win even against the lowly Detroit Lions, especially turnovers in the red zone. Once again, if you throw three interceptions and it's like a punt and the game's 0-0, who cares? But when you're down 8-0, to zero, you, you throw one in, 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 you know, in, the, uh, in the red zone, and I think they were down 8-0. Maybe it was 0-0 zero, zero at that point. One, and one, one of the interceptions he threw it, the game was still at 0-0. Zero, zero. And once again, the incompetence of Matt LaFleur to not run the football on one of the worst teams against the run in the NFL sure beats me. But that's a story for another day. Is it, though? 
I mean, that's who Green Bay is for some reason. They they are just – they throw the football inside the 10 so much that it's like borderline ignorant. I, I, I don't know why. But why why won't they change their philosophy – around what's happening you don't have any you don't have any skilled players at the receiver position that's fine you don't have much talent that's okay why are we still throwing it up and not running the football is there a power struggle between Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers behind closed doors more than whatever the perception is I mean there really aren't any public hints of it but there has to be some rhyme or reason why Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon who have the capability to be arguably the best one-two punch at the running back position in the league from a talent perspective, why they aren't being utilized to their fullest, like their highest ceiling here. Or, and, let me, and let me just say, Aaron Jones did go out of the game with the ankle injury, but I still don't care. If that's generally the case, speaking, though. Generally if, if that's the Because he wasn't running the ball that much before then anyway. Like they, they just, you know what I'm saying? So – and, yeah, they were running the ball. Aaron Jones was getting a yard to carry, two yards to carry. Same thing for A.J. Dillon. But in this game, if you're going to run the ball behind against the Buffalo Bills, then why why are we then going to suddenly go out and throw the ball 50 times against the Detroit Lions and still lose the football game? Makes no sense. We could probably talk a full episode about Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers, this game, big win for Detroit regardless. Regardless, it took the football away many times. And that's a win that's going to probably, like, for sure keep Dan Campbell around at least another year. And we'll see what kind of work he can do with the Detroit Lions. Get Aaron Rodgers some skill players. He doesn't have any help. I can, I can hear the people screaming already, which segues into my next conversation. Look what happens when you get – a guy some help because can we talk about Tua and Justin Fields and what was just a barrage of offense. But let's start with Justin Fields who has no help and he has no weapons. So he did it his damn self. 170 rushing yards on the ground, couple touchdowns through the air until they have a re solidified coaching staff there. I, I just, I feel for Justin Fields much like we felt for Mr. Trubisky. Maybe he's not getting the fairest of all shakes, but the Bears have been playing football, better football, quietly the last couple weeks, and Justin Fields is doing a lot with a little, like next to nothing. Nothing against Darnell Mooney. He's not a number one. He's a field stretcher. Nothing against Cole Komet, right? Serviceable tight end. Probably still has some upside. He's still very young. But Justin Fields is really impressive, and what a monster fantasy day, by the way. Like, total slate breaker. Yeah, I mean, here's the deal. I think, and this is what you have to do, I feel, with young quarterbacks. Don't try to take the square peg and make it fit into a round hole, right? If it's a square peg, their first season, give them a square hole to stick their square peg in, right? Like, don't. Don't try to reinvent the wheel for the rookie quarterback in year one. And so I think what happens is these quarterbacks come in from college. They're used to a certain, not only a certain system, right? Not only a certain system, but a certain style of play, right? Because th- there is a system, but they have a certain style. So when you watch or watched, rather, Justin Fields played Ohio State, you saw certain concepts, right, under that in that system and it became a style of play and you would see him if things broke down, there were certain things he would do to help that team continue to progress and be a a, a national championship team. Right. Okay. So then why is it, if he comes into the NFL, you then try to give him an extreme crash course in a completely pro concepts is what I'm saying. Right. So, In year one, give him more of what he's comfortable with so that you can see, okay, first of all, just can he perform at a professional level, right? So don't make it so complicated. Don't Just can he perform at a professional level, okay? So we figured that out. We've checked that box. 
two. Now, what is he good at that we can use to our advantage until the other things we need him to do catch up, right? I firmly believe that the reason the Chicago Bears are a little bit more successful recently in terms of looking better, because that this hasn't translated into a bunch of wins, okay? So let's, let's just get that out of the way. It's not like they started winning games, but they look better on TV. What is the one thing, Justin, and I think you can answer this, what is the one thing that Justin Fields is doing now that he probably wasn't doing last year or earlier this season more of? Run the damn ball. Running the football. Now, and here's the thing. He's a young quarterback still. This is his second season. Justin, if it's not there, you have the ability now, right? Get out, get outside. Let's stretch some plays. If it's not there, don't take a big hit. Slide, get out of bounds, pick up as many yards as you can, but don't take the big hit, right? Don't do it. And if you look at early this season, what was he doing, Luke? Seriously, sitting in the pocket, trying to wait on plays to develop, couldn't throw guys open, and what was he doing? Taking big hits. Just go watch the film. I mean, I, we saw him get crushed on like a Monday night. Uh, just trying to sit in the pocket and throw the football when nothing's there. I mean, crushed, crushed. And now what do you see? It's not there? No problem. I'll take off. I'll pick up what I can, and we'll keep the change moving. Keep, and so now they've gone from an offense that looks complete that looked completely anemic to an offense that can now move the chains a little bit. It's more exciting when Justin Fields gets outside and runs the football when he has to right? Guess what else that does? Now, the defense can't just sit there and tee off. Okay, you can go ahead and blitz if you like, but if you blitz in the wrong place, I'm getting rid of the ball quickly or I'm running out of it. And so now defenses have to play them a bit more honestly. And if he continues to progress, my, my prediction is by year four, he's one of the better quarterbacks in the league. If he continues to progress, that's the caveat. He has double-digit rushing attempts in four games this season. Three of them have come in the last four weeks. So there's a How many shit. points have they scored in those games? I don't have it pulled up. Oh, no, I got you right here, brother. I got you right here. So this past week – sorry, did I cut you off there, Luke? Please forgive me if I did. I'm so sorry. This past week, the Chicago Bears scored 32 points. 32. That I mean, I, th I think that's I think that's good. Against the Cowboys, now they did take a, a, a bludgeoning against the Cowboys. In Dallas, might I add, in Dallas, they scored 29 points. The week before that, they beat the Patriots 33 to 14. Luch, can, do you hear these scoring numbers now that you're unleashing the quarterback and allowing him to utilize his most valuable skill set against defenses where where his where he's currently sitting. It's not that he can't throw the ball. I don't think it's anything like that. But right now, his legs are what is going to carry them the rest of the way this season. Not that he's got to use them every play. But when it's available, he's got the green light. 33 points, 29 points, 32 points, Luke. The scoring is there. Now can they pick up the wins? They're one and three in their last three. This week, uh, they get the Detroit Lions. Dare I say, lose. I'm not expecting the Bears to lose to Detroit at home. The Bears should if the Bears should be able to put up another 30 points this week. And if they do that, guess what's coming down the pipeline later this season? Lucha, are you ready for this? In week 13, the Green Bay Packers come to town on December 4th in Chicago. And I'm telling you right now, if the Bears are continuing to put up points throughout the week, it's going to be ugly for Green Bay that game. Especially after Aaron Rodgers has come to town and says, I own you. Oh, buddy. People will not forget this when he's got to go to Soldier Field. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be very ugly. And prior to that, 
just to tie it all together, Green Bay will have the Eagles the week before. Yeah, the there Eagles. are there are plenty of people in Chicago who will not forget that we own you talks. Chicago is the second biggest city in the country, I believe. So plenty of people will oh, remember. Oh, the memories are there. Green Bay has the Titans in week 11. They Listen. have the Cowboys next week. Listen, Green Bay is spiraling out of control, and the Bears are on the upswing. Minnesota is probably going to win this division. The Bears will finish second. I like it. And it's a big step forward for the Bears and Justin Fields. They should be spending a lot of time in the offseason looking at what Greg Roman did with Lamar Jackson to scheme that entire system. I mean, look at Baltimore, Chief. There's no pass catchers in Baltimore. They even shipped out Hollywood Brown. Uh, aside of Mark Andrews, of course. No disrespect to Mark Andrews. I mean, th- that's it. Similar setup in Chicago. I'm not saying Fields is on the Lamar Jackson tier, but he has the skills to kind of replicate the same dimensions that Lamar Jackson brings to an offense. Lamar Jackson is not the most accurate passer in the league, but he throws a decent ball. He gets out of the pocket and he keeps defenses guessing every play. And it's a nightmare for defensive coordinators. Justin Fields has that skill set. And that is a division where there's not a lot of defense to be played. So I think he is set up for some success. And I think Justin Fields can throw better than Lamar long term. Yeah. Long term. Here's what I will say. Here's where I think I will know for sure where the Bears organization is headed after this season. Do they go out and get him an ultimate weapon? Like, I'm using this as an example because I think we've seen this in recent years. Young quarterback needs an ultimate weapon. Hurts, they go and get A.J. Brown, right? And we see what what happened there. Tua, they already had Jalen, but they go and get Tyreek Hill. And look at this offense now. They don't have some stellar running back. Similar to the Bears. But look, at they went and got Tyreek Hill, and all of a sudden, this offense looks, I mean, Luch is pretty unstoppable. Doesn't mean they're going to win games. But you can't really stop the offense with Tua, Waddle, and uh, and Hill. Okay? I'm going to give you another one. This is going a little further back, and I think I've talked about this before, so please bear with me, folks. I'm on repeat mode here. The Bills go and get Stephon Diggs. Right? When Josh Allen's a young quarterback and need, needs a safety blanket, needs success, need, needs a guy, right? They go out, they get Stephon Diggs, and look at look at how the team kind of begins yeah. to turn the corner. Here. Yeah, this one hasn't really worked out, but the Arizona Cardinals. Yeah, I, I know, I know it has it has worked out for Hop. His numbers haven't really taken that big of a dip, right? But the team just hasn't been able to put together wins. But I'm with you, like. This is what I'm talking about. When you've got a young quarterback, you're going to do it two ways. You're going to get the best receiver you can in the draft, or you're going to go out and get a guy that's on the waiver wire. Now, here's what I will say, and I'm talking about this. This is more of a next season call. The Cleveland Browns are going to be a really tough out when Deshaun Watson is that quarterback because going to get Amari Cooper was their move. Now, Amari is still young enough to contribute, and I think he gets better with Deshaun Watson there, similar to how Cooks would have been the guy or any other number one receiver. I'm expecting Amari Cooper to put up monster numbers down the stretch as Watson gets acclimated into the offense. I'm expecting him to be rusty the first two weeks, Luke. I'm not expecting him to come out like a world beater. But I'm saying next season, when Watson gets to start fresh, Amari Cooper – if he comes out under a thousand yards next season, go ahead and hammer that over as soon as it hits the books because it's coming. It is coming. And so that's what I'm saying. Has it worked out for the Raiders going to get uh going to get Devontae? But Devontae's numbers have suffered a little because of these stinker games he's had. But it but outside of the stinkers, man, he's put up monster games. He had another one this past week. Like, you gotta go and get the guy. And and I think if you do that. If they do that with the Bears, they did get Chase Claypool. Uh, I, I think that was interesting. I think it's good for him because Chase is like a gadget guy. 
uh, you know, a, a much stronger receiver than Mooney. Won't be flying down the field, but I think he's good for them if they go and get a true number one. There was over 700 yards of offense in that game. And what does Miami have that Chicago doesn't, though? And this isn't any Bears coaching slander, but Mike McDaniel is a freaking genius. Creativity, trust. He has that locker room. Young head coach, under 40 years old, which is the newer trend. Pretty analytical. He's got the swagger. He's a little cocky. Uh, He's confident, but the players play for him. And they do have a good bond, it seems. And just the leap Tua has made, you could bring in Tyreek Hill. Fantastic upgrade. But all the other things that McDaniel and his coaching staff have been able to clean up with Tua, the, the, fo- the footwork, you know, he's a very unorthodox, has a very unorthodox style. Everything about Tua is not textbook at all. And he's having a fantastic gear. He's he, while dealing with an injury plague season, quietly, very scary moment earlier this season, as we all know. And he has 15 touchdowns, three picks. They're winning football games and they're a threat. I, I don't know who they're going to stop defensively, but they could put up points in the best of the best shootouts. And that's for damn sure. So another team, very active. They got Tyreek Hill. They made a flurry of moves. You know, they bring in Chase Edmonds, they bring in Mostert. You know, Edmonds is out, out of the picture already. They're they're active. They're not they content. go get Bradley up for defense. They know they have a window, a big window of opportunity here. And they're gonna be a big go, player. Go get, yeah. And, and I, I I think they've already signed Bradley Chubb to his extension, which says to me, hey, we we want it, we want it now. The Jets losing to the Bills, which is another Thing we can we can talk about briefly the Jets yeah, they, losing. They won, bud. No, no, no. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, the Bills losing to the Jets. Oh, okay, Excuse okay. Me. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for the correction. Sorry, listeners. The Bills losing to the Jets may have, in fact, infused the Miami Dolphins with a little bit of hope because well, now yeah. that's what they're saying. Wait, well, wait a minute. This this division's wide open. Like this, every week, you see tiered rankings of each team and this and that and the Bills and the Chiefs and the Eagles are just on another level. This is anybody's league. This season is wide open and we have seen it case point to a T. The Houston Texans gave the Philadelphia Eagles a run for their money for three quarters uh, on Thursday night football. The New York Jets the New York Jets contained Josh Allen about as well as you can contain Josh Allen and they got it done. They squeaked it out. And let me say this: okay. last season, though, and, and I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm thinking about this, Luke, and I'm starting to think. And I'm not trying to overreact, but Josh Allen on Loki had a problem with the Jets in New York for two seasons back to back. Now, like last last year, if you watched him play the Jets, it was something similar. I mean, it was field goal after field goal. I said, "What in the world is happening?" To the Bills, maybe the Jets just have their number here. But the difference is this season the Jets are actually have a winning record. Last season, not so much. This season the Jets keep winning. Uh, You know, who knows what can happen by the end of the season when we get down to this thing, when we're at week 14 and the Jets go to the Bills. Chief, we talked right. about it. They have a soft schedule, and we didn't pencil this in as a win. And th- this is – No, we win. did not. Huge win for the Jets. Now, yeah. so what I'm saying is this week, and I didn't even get to my last point, was the Titans can't roll in the arrowhead and, and pace with the Chiefs, with Malik Willis, who is not ready, with a super limited playbook. These teams know what the Tennessee Titans are going to do, especially without Ryan Tannehill. And Traylon Burks has been out a month. And Robert Woods isn't a number one receiver. It's still 90% snaps with Nick Westbrook, Akina, and Shiga Conko, the rookie from Maryland, and Jeff Swaim is running pass routes. That's how good this Titans team actually is because there's not an ounce of creativity from the offensive coordinator because he's inept as well. But 
they're still contending in these games that no one, Mike Vrabel, like tip my cap to Mike Vrabel, AJ Brown, the whole saga, it, it's over. It's over. And I think, I think he was blindsided by that. I think there was a lot of things behind closed doors there. And I'm not so sure. I just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth with the way AJ Brown was hinting at things and, and, and whatever. So they lost arguably their one B biggest playmaker, Ryan Tannehill's hurt. And you go into Arrowhead and that game was for the taking chief. So be, uh, this isn't about the Tennessee Titans, although I do think that defense is very good. And you can say, well, Mahomes at 460 yards, but he threw the ball 68 times, <laughs> 68 yeah. times. That's more than Malik Willis will throw this entire season. So <laughs> honestly, it's very like, true though. So the, the Titans are one, you know, they force teams to be one dimensional. They stop the run. Jeffrey Simmons is the best defender in football. Nobody talks about really. And the moral of this little mini rant was that everyone has an Achilles heel in a game with four quarters. That's it. This isn't a series. This isn't baseball that I think we're going to have maybe the most exciting playoffs in about a decade this season, because they're the, the, the skill gap between these teams, even the quote unquote, really good teams, the chiefs bills and Eagles that everyone wants to put on their own tier is pretty minuscule chief. And I think this was the week that illustrated that. Well, let's talk about it since we're here because we were kind of maybe hinting at this. I can't remember if it was last week. If not, folks, I'm sorry. We'll talk about it this week. In the AFC East, there are no losing teams. There are zero. Zero losing teams exist in the AFC East, lose. The Bills are 6-2. and two. Don't look now. The Jets and the Dolphins are six and three. And the Patriots are five and four. There's zero losing teams in the AFC East this season. Do you know who else has zero losing teams in their football conference lose by chance? Right off the top head. No. Good, because there are none. That's how okay. tough exactly. that's how tough the AFC East is gonna be down the street. Like I want you to think about this because this the Jets pulling off this win has now created, in my opinion, a little AFC East controversy. The Bills don't have the shoe in to the division anymore. Like if they won this game. They would have been seven and one. The Jets would have been five and four. Dolphins six and three. Patriots five and four. They lose this game, and now the pecking order is basically nothing. There's no difference, really. Now they're going to have to figure out how much do we beat up on each other. This is I'm this Jets win literally changed this 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 uh, this division overnight. And so I'm interested to see, because here's the other thing. Everybody has trouble going to Miami. Every team, Patriots, Jets, Bill, they're going to have serious trouble going to Miami. The question is, how much trouble does Miami have when they go up there? And I'm, I'm just, Luke, I'm actually, I think I feel like the Bills may not, and I'm not trying to overreact. I'm, I'm just talking about the particulars, okay? Because because for me, I thought the one game the Bills might actually have trouble with was the Miami game. Do you get what I'm saying? Like that, that's really where I'm headed with this. Like I didn't figure they'd have trouble with the Jets. And so when I'm when I'm looking at the Dolphins and I'm looking at their games, and I'm saying, well. You look at they beat the Patriots twenty to seven in in the eleventh, right? I'm, I'm talking about their schedule here. They beat the Patriots already at home. They beat the Ravens on the road. They beat the Bills already at home. Remember, everybody has trouble going to Miami. They've already beat the Bills. 
Lost to the Bengals, lost to the Jets, 40 to 7. But I'm going to give them a pass. Two was kind of out. You know what I'm saying? They lose to the, the Vikings 24 to 16. Then they beat the Steelers. They beat the Lions. They just beat the Bears, right? And they get the Browns. They get the Texans. They get the 49ers in San Francisco. It's going to be a tough game. They get the Chargers. They go to the Bills. They get the Packers. They go to New England. They get the Jets at home. And I, I, my assumption is on January 8th, they beat the Jets at home. As long as two is healthy and his office has been humming along. My assumption is they go one for one with the split. I think they can still beat the Patriots on the road. Okay? I think they beat the Packers. I think they beat the Browns. I think they beat the Dolphins. Maybe they lose to the 49ers on the road. I think they beat the Chargers. The question, Luch, here here's the big one. If they beat Buffalo in Buffalo, Buffalo does not win this division. And that's where I'm headed with this with, with this AFC East. If the if the Dolphins beat the Bills in Buffalo, Buffalo is now a wild card team and it's going to get very interesting as a Buffalo wild card team versus everything running through Buffalo. Because if it's got to run through Miami, everybody's going to have trouble. Everybody <sighs> Isn't this crazy? There's going to be two to three very good football teams coming out of that division that nobody's going to want any part of. Nobody is going to want any part of any of those teams. Not. Nah. It is. It is crazy. You, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, it's insane, really. Like, because really, what I'm thinking about, Luke, I'm sorry, and I know we go from this from the AFC East, but what I'm thinking about is where this division has come from it used to be the Patriots and the Patriots just kind of beat up on everybody and even if the Patriots didn't win a lot of out of conference games they were pretty much going to run through the division and head into the playoffs and see what happened that now everything's got to run through the AFC East almost it's insane I would never want to see a Buffalo wild card team that would be as a oh, fan gosh. Of- as a fan of whatever team you're a fan of, and you say, wow, my team gets to host a first-round playoff game, and it's the Bills that have to come to town, that wouldn't sit well. Wouldn't sit well, well. Luch, my last thing about the AFC East is this. We've really boosted up the NFC East because the Eagles, the Cowboys, and the Giants, the Commanders are one game under 500. Like, we've kind of given the NFC East, like, oh, this is the division. But really, it's the AFC East. Albeit no team is undefeated. Like, this is probably the toughest division in football this season. And that's something. That is certainly something. And I think what else opened the door is the implosion of the Indianapolis Colts. Oh, boy. The Tennessee Titans sweep the Colts, which was pretty much the dagger in the chest. Jonathan Taylor's been off the field a couple games this season. Frank Reich is now gone. Jeff Saturday, though. Interim head coach. Happy for Jeff. Me too. I think that could turn into something special. I want to see how he – how the players respond to him, especially a locker room – uh, that is dealing with a lot of turmoil right now and not winning football games. This is not the Colts team that was as advertised that oddsmakers and everyone was backing in July and August. This is the Colts division, right? Like mm-hmm. they were more than minus 110 favorites on most books to win the division. And they can't establish the run. The offensive line failed them miserably. And then the concerns that were able to be hidden behind the offensive line and run game. Boy, did they really swim up to the surface quickly. No solidified playmakers outside of Michael Pittman Jr. Is Michael Pittman Jr. even a number one wide receiver? I don't know. Maybe he's not ready. Jonathan Taylor, clearly not 100%. And even when he was, he couldn't run the ball like he did last season. That line is the bread and butter of that team. Who better than Jeff Saturday to figure it out, though? So, Listen, 
Remember what the Colts did last year? Remember the second half surge they had? And everybody was like, here we go. Now, different circumstances. Matt Ryan benched for the young kid already. And I don't foresee that happening. There's going to be way too many growing pains on top of, you know, the coaching carousel here. And I hope that Jeff Saturday is the right move. Uh, Maybe it's long-term. If he's not the long-term move, I hope they figure it out soon because this could just be another Chicago situation where there's too many coordinators, you know, really hard for a young quarterback to develop when you're implemented and thrown into so many systems year in and year out. Cause then football doesn't come slow at all. What I'm saying is the game moves too fast when you're thinking too much and we'll see what happens. But Indy imploding opened the door for someone else to get into the playoff picture, whether it's a second or third team from the AFC East, whether the AFC North gets two or three teams. in. now for a while, we kind of thought the AFC North would be the team, the, the division to get three playoff teams in. And right now it's looking like it's the AFC East. No. Yeah. I I think because here's why Luke, I'm looking at the schedule. The Browns should lose again to Miami this week. I, th- I think they play Miami this week. Their best shot is probably the Ravens or the Bengals. And I'm going to side with the Ravens right now. So the Bengals play the Steelers this coming Sunday. That should be a win. Not No, no, not this coming Sunday. I'm sorry. Uh, in two weeks. They, they, they should beat the Steelers. But I'm not taking them to beat the Titans. I'm just I'm not doing that. Like I, I don't think I don't think they beat the Titans in Tennessee. I, I don't see it. I don't think they beat the Chiefs at home. I think they beat the Browns. I think they beat the Buckers. I'm not sure if they beat the Patriots. I think the Bills went on the road, and I don't think they beat the Ravens. You give them it's like I and look, weird things can happen. I understand. And let me just say, even though the Bills lost to the Jets, I'm not writing off the Bills. I still think they're one of the best teams in football. To me, this is more about the Jets being a lot better than we anticipated uh, after a brutal loss the week before, right? Like, they're still a young team, and I think that's what you're seeing. They're a young, charismatic team. Like, Sauce Gardner might be their best player. But he plays on defense. Well, what is Sala? He's a defensive coach. Like, you know, it's like they're a young chaotic team and they're going to have some growing pain still. The the Jets most likely lose, are going to lose a game that they shouldn't, even though they just beat the Bills. They've got to go to the Patriots. The Bears come to town. They got to go to the Vikings. Like, they've got a fairly tough schedule down the stretch. And that might end up being their Achilles heel. If they beat the Patriots this week, then it's getting real interesting because the Patriots will be 500 and they'll be seven and three. I'm expecting Miami to win this week. They'll be seven and three. Uh, The Bills should probably win. Uh, Let's see who the Bills play. I just want to make sure I got this right. They play Minnesota. Yes. The Bills play the Vikings, but they're at home. I'm going to give them the edge here after a brutal, not brutal, but a gut wrenching loss. To the Jets, you've heard Josh Allen. See, this is what I'm talking about. You've heard Josh Allen come on online. He doesn't put it on the team. He says, well, no team's going to win where your quarterback plays like dog poop. That, listen, I can accept that from the, from the quarterback of the team. Guess what he's going to do this week? He's going to get it right. He's going to make sure that he puts this team in a position to win. We're tying this show together. This show is like one big spider web this week. Everything's connected. You don't get that from Aaron Rodgers. You get blame and cryptic messages and no accountability or responsibility. Am I right or am I right? I'm freaking right. You're right. So I'm thinking Josh Allen comes out this week. They've got the Vikings, another tough test. And I think they win this game just because they're going to ensure it's going to be, I think it's very uncomfortable in that locker room this week and not in a, not in a bad way in a, Hey, let's go out and take care of business type way. No fun, no games. Let's work. Let's put our heads down. Let's win this game and get back on track. All right, Luke, I'm done. 
Well, let's look ahead and we can talk about that game. We're going to learn a lot about the Minnesota Vikings and their grittiness. Bills, the Bills are going to be pissed off. They're going to be focused. And we're going to see what the Vikings got on the road. Going to be a little chilly up there. And I know the Vikings are having a fantastic season. The defense is very leaky. This is setting up for an enormous Josh Allen Sunday. Enormous day. That, that That's my call. I think they win by 10. Uh, the Vikings are top 10 friendliest in passing, uh, successful passing plays. They're also top 10, uh, like teams are throwing against them too. So like they're identifying it. Like, so, so teams are passing against Minnesota 65% of the time. They don't pressure quarterbacks a lot. They give clean pockets up at a top five highest rate in the league. This isn't a week I'd want to see Buffalo. That's for sure. Especially yeah. when I need to travel there. I, I think we're setting up for a big Josh Allen. I, he'll be he'll be the cash game play in DFS, for sure. But got to give kudos to Minnesota though because they're in. They have one loss. They're winning football games in the National Football League. They went out and got Kirk Cousins yet another weapon, and T.J. Hawkinson. Yes. And I have to applaud that. When you have a rare opportunity to really seize this division, and they're jockeying for the top seed in the NFC, and no one's talking about it. I know the Eagles haven't lost, but the Vikings are one game behind in the loss column. That dome would be electric. You don't want to go up and play through Minnesota inside. You don't no. want to do that. You don't want no. to do that. Because you know why? You are for sure – Going to have to work on some silent snap counts and a whole new cadence when you go play up there in Minneapolis. So I, I'm I'm really interested in this game to see, A, if Minnesota can win. Could you imagine if Buffalo loses back-to-back games to the Jets and the Vikings? It's in the realm of possibilities. If, if they lose to the Vikings this week, they, they could still be on track if they – crush the rest of the division. But now there's no room for error. Like, they can't lose any division games. It, man, I, that, that's a good one, Jay. If, if they lost to the Vikings this week, the media would probably think this team is off the rails, which I wouldn't agree with. But I don't, I'm, I'm not expecting them to lose this week for what it's worth. For what it's worth. They are seven and a half point favorites, and I think that's a fair number. And for the record, I don't think they lose. I think they win. I think they win by 10 plus. But I do think the Vikings can keep up, which is the difference. Like, to me, that's the big difference here. Like, if they score 35 points, the Vikings can score 28 points. Like, this team can score points. Like, that, that, so to me, that's the big difference. It, it, does Josh Allen slip up with another costly turnover? At the wrong time, and and open the door for the Vikings and say, whoa, wait, wait a minute, we we got a big shot here to win. If if the Vikings win this week, like people might start calling, you know, I, you might want to go out and get them on uh, on the books for some Super Bowl odds. Because right now in the NFC, I think people still think it's the the Cowboys or the Eagles, and I'm wondering what their odds are to go to the Super Bowl if. And honestly, you probably better get that before the game starts. Because once they win, the odds are going to change, I think. In my opinion. Because that would be a quality win on the road. And they're, sh- can, they're certainly going to win the NFC North. Certainly. You can get you can get them at 16-1 to 1 on FanDuel or MGM. 18-1 to 1 on DraftKings. Listen. I mean, listen. It's not my favorite team. We're in the business of making money here. Luch, I think 18 to 1 is good odds to say, hey, we're mid season and they're 7 and 1. Those are good odds, Luch. The Bills are inside 3 to 1. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, if they lose yeah. this week and, 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 and the Vikings win, that's probably going down, what do you think, 12 to 1, 10 to 1? Yeah, like maybe, maybe, maybe 6 to 1. And I'd consider buying low. For sure. It's a buy low spot. Yeah. 
I mean, this is – I mean, you, you'd have it tied up for the season, but, man, the whew, the reward on that one I think could be monumental, getting a midseason at – you said 18-1 to 1 on DK? Uh, yeah, that's what uh, scores and odds.com oh, is showing me. Oh, boy. And look so, at that, folks. Just like that, you've got a scores and odds plug. Get over there. Do you like, ch- do you like check narratives? Yeah, check out scores and odds. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Parley IQ is still free over there, too. It'll change the, By way, the way you bet on same game parlays. By the way. No, you go ahead. I, I was I was I was adding to what you were saying. That by oh. the way was yes, it's still free, by the way. Oh, we were having a dramatic pause. I got excited for a second. <laughs> Well, so what's your call on the game, by the way? I, I say Bills by 10. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm going to give it to him inside of 10 on this one. I, I think Minnesota can put up put up enough points to uh, to, to get there. I'm, I'm going to give him inside of 10. I, I, I think – I think the Bills win by four. I think a very overlooked personnel upgrade is the fact that Travius White was taken off IR. He didn't play this week, but he could very well be making his debut this Sunday against the Vikings against Justin Jefferson, which makes a lot of sense. This is a top five corner in the league, folks, and the Bills are about to finally get him back in the mix. So that that is big. Two teams we talked about a lot today. Detroit Lions are going to Chicago as three-point dogs. And everything we talked about makes me want to take Chicago minus three because the Lions are coming off an incredible high. I know momentum's funny, but that was more of a Green Bay loss than a Detroit win, I think. Yeah. That's not what the story showed. But Chicago had about – as respectable of a loss as you could have. And I'm thinking I'm taking the Bears at home. I think they win this football game by more than three. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I think the Bears take care of business here. I mean, they've been scoring about 30 points a game the past three weeks, and I'm not expecting that to change this week, not with the way Justin Fields has been playing. Uh, I do think Chase Claypool having an extra <clears throat> an extra week with the staff to kind of develop and get get a little bit more acclimated to the playbook. Uh, I think that'll open it up for him. Uh, I do think Chase Claypool changes this offense enough for this season, right? Because, like I said, it's just, it, it does give uh, Fields another weapon. Mooney can get down the field. Komet can catch some of these intermediate throws, another big body. And Claypool, to me, is kind of a, you know, big body Swiss Army knife type. Strong receiver, you know, can, can can help them, you know, gather a few more possessions. These are the types of things I see with this team. So when they get a chance to play, a team that they can beat, they have to do it. I think they go out and take care of business. Another one for you. We got a 930 game, Tampa Bay and Seattle. The Bucks are two and a half point favorites. I think, I think that's Seattle wrong. Wins this football game. Yeah, I think it's yeah, wrong too. I think that's wrong. I, I, I think Seattle should be favored here. It, what's happening is Tom Brady is going to keep getting respect and Geno Smith is not. And that's what's happened. The Seahawks are six and three folks. They should be the favorites here, but they're not. It makes no sense. I, I, I don't understand it, but Hey, that that's why there, there are guys like us to help you for our, all of your sports betting interest. And what we're saying is I would be taking the Seahawks this week. You should write it up. Scores and odds. Write it up. Yeah. No, you're a prop guy. You're a big prop guy on there. But man, I, I think I I think after talking through this, I want to write up Chicago and maybe Seattle. Maybe we maybe we do a food for thought two leg parlay. Because <laughs> I like both those calls as of right now. I mean it's yeah. Monday, but it seems right. I that Seattle game has it could come down to the last possession, but I think they're the better football team, which is which is crazy. But a quarterback, oh, God. a quarterback correlates directly so much with the team's output. We're not seeing Tom Brady play at that high level anymore, Chief. Yeah, he's not. But but like I said, massive respect for him. 
I mean, manufacturing another win for this football team in 44 seconds. Like, it's just – it's it's really incredible career he's had. Like, I, I think he should have retired after the Super Bowl with the Bucks. Like, I think that was the prime time for him to do it. I'm not too happy about Tom because I'm not like a Brady fan. I'm more of a – I respect him for his accomplishments over the years. He, I think he should have retired after the, the Buccaneers Super Bowl and went out in a blaze of glory. Instead, he wanted to keep playing. He's still playing now, and he's probably going to retire this season. But I think he'll push it another season just because he, can, he can't now go out and retire optically after the divorce. Like, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I'm wrong, but I think he should have left in a blaze of glory, and it might have changed – He's going into the Hall of Fame, but just leaving out on top. You know what I mean? I think there's something just saying, hey, Mike dropping it. I got this championship. I'm out. Can we have a five-minute fun little debate here before we jump into uh, story time? Yeah. And GP, GPP food of the day. Because you said the word Hall of Fame, and I had some tabs pulled up here. Because Amari Cooper was a name that I cannot believe that he's – you know, 28, 29 years old. And I was looking at Mike Evans as well. Oh. Mike Evans is. I'm sorry, Luke, Luke. Please forgive me. Yes. Can I give you one more plug here? Yes. Even with their tough schedule, you can get the Jets at plus 2200 on Sugar House for the AFC division winner. You can get Miami at plus 575. Like, these are these interesting in-season ones where it's like, ah, we're, we're getting a little close because Buffalo is minus 450 on bet MGM. And I, can't I, I, right now. I can't do it right now at minus 450. Right. Right. I, right I, you can. I'm here to tell you, folks, that getting a little something in on Jets plus 2200 and Dolphins plus 575 for the AFC East division winner – I, I think those odds are in our favor. Whether they whether it comes through or not, like we're getting really good odds midseason for a team that just lost to the Jets and a team that the Dolphins have already beat once. You get what I'm saying? It's, it's about where we are in the season versus what I think could actually happen. The Jets just feel so wrong. It feels so wrong to take that bet. My mind's telling me no. Remember that one? <laughs> I get it, man. I like I really get it. It feel it feels gross. Taking Miami at plus five fifty is definitely better. Like that's the right play. But the Jets it gosh, man, that's better odds than the Vikings going to the Super Bowl, winning the Super Bowl. It's a great time to hedge. I mean, if you're a little if you're a Bills backer or from preseason and you're a little concerned. I'd, I'd take those odds now on Miami, at least. <laughs> and you would have to start yeah. with the Jets at that point, too, right? Like quarter unit play, maybe. Just if you want to cover yeah. cover yourself a little bit. Where are we at with the oh. Jets? Well, okay, here, here may be a better one, Luke. Jets are plus 112 to make the playoffs right now on FanDuel. Like, that's, I mean, you know, because basically now what you're saying is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie up some money for two months, banking on the Jets making the playoffs. I like it. Plus 112 on FanDuel. Not too bad. That's, I like it. That's fine. Okay. All right. Back to your original thing. Sorry, sorry I hijacked that. I just – you got me entangled in these odds, and I start poking around, and I'm like, wait a minute. This is, this is a little juicy here. You're right. It was worth – it was worth it for sure. Definitely gonna have to look into. The, I like the Jets. I think the Jets. I don't think the Jets win the division, but I think they make the playoffs. We could talk about this forever. Yeah, more material for next week. We'll see what happens until then with the New York football teams. So, is Amari Cooper a Hall of Famer? I don't know. I mean, I cannot believe that it's 2022 and Amari Cooper's 28 years old. Been in the league eight years already. If my math is right, and Mike Evans is 29, I feel like he was just catching passes from Johnny Football, lighting it up in tech, you know, at a and I, I, I feel like that was yesterday. There was maybe not a more exciting duo 
like Johnny Manziel and Mike Evans, they were they were just ballers, and they've always had the swag. You know, Mike Evans had let, a hell of a little career. Let me just say, if those two guys were able to make money in college, Johnny Manziel would have been a millionaire before he hit the NFL. And man, it may not have been good for him. But but the money would have been there. Because he, I mean, he, Johnny Manziel is probably one of the greatest college football legends of all time, to, to be quite honest with you. The legend of Johnny Manziel. I mean, winning football games, money signs in the air when the quarterback, I mean, it just it was it was fun. And it made that team very relevant. Like even against Alabama, like they didn't get steamrolled like that. That team incredibly well that day. So I'm with you, man. Is Amari Cooper a Hall of Famer? The Ken he I think t- he, he's not now. He has four thousand yard seasons. But Mike Evans is the one that Mike Evans. First of all, Randy Moss. I'm not putting these guys in the same. No, no, no. I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you. I but, understand what you're saying. But Randy Moss had 10 1,000 yard plus receiving seasons. Mike Evans has eight straight, and he's gonna get nine unless he gets hurt oh, this yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. He's well on his way. Well, but, but what the hell's a thousand yards anymore in this era of football? So at what point, what point do we gradually stop making a thousand yard seasons look sexy because they're really not that impressive anymore? Because everyone except the damn Titans throws football. The Titans are the square peg trying to go in the round hole in this in this league. I still think there's value in it, considering like. You got to be over a thousand if you're the number one guy, and I think that's I, I think to me that's the difference, right? Like a thousand yard seasons back in the day, I think were more impressive because yeah, teams ran the football more, but I don't feel like the the distribution of wide receiver talent was as uh, fair. Let me say, like every team was going to have a number one guy, but that was going to be it. Like, you'd have Randy Moss, and then you'd have, you know, these other guys. Like, of course, the Patriots, I know they had Troy Brown. They had to run. Like, don't get me wrong. I understand. But I'm saying, generally speaking, you weren't going to see two guys that could probably be number ones. And to me, that's the difference in today's NFL. When you look at the Dolphins, you've got Tyreek Hill and you've got Waddle. Both can be number ones, but both being on the team makes them so hard to stop. So one is open. The other is open. The other is open. The other you know what I mean? When Amari was in Dallas and he had C.D. Lamb there, then it's like, okay, pick your poison. What? Who do you want to stop? Let's go back a little bit further. When you have, uh, I mean, and, and look, th- this guy's crazy, okay? Don't get me wrong. But you have Antonio Brown and Juju. Like, what? Like who, who are you going to stop today? You know what I mean? It's like. When when the league is set up like that, the the, the Bengals they've got Boyd, <laughs> Chase, and T Higgins. It's 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 really tough sledding. You've got with the Vikings, and, and yeah, Adam Thielen's gotten a little older now. He used to be faster. He used to be better, of course. But Thielen and Jefferson, and you go out to the Chargers. Keenan Allen's getting older, but you had Allen and Williams. They're both hurt. You know, you go to San Francisco. You've got Ayuk and Debo Samuel, and now you've got to stop Christian McCaffrey. You So the more we add this up, you go to Buffalo. You've got Gabe Davis, who's kind of a big outside threat. You've got Stephon Diggs. So all these teams now have these guys that could be a number one on another team, but they better as 1A, 1B, or a strong one, and then like, a lesser one. And and that's where I think today's NFL is going, which is why I do still think a thousand yards is, is still good, but typically the number one is going to go for 1400 now. The guy may go for eight, nine, a thousand. What we're seeing in Miami, I'm actually hoping Tyree kill hits the 2000 mark this year. That that's, that's what I want to see. If Tyree kill hits 2000 yards. Wow. And and I, and I think if he's close down the stretch, Luke, if he's anywhere in striking distance, let's say the last game of the season, he's at like eighteen forty-two. 
you better believe they're going to try to get him 2,000 yards that game. You better believe it. They're, they're going to run screen plays. They're going to run out routes. They're going to do whatever they can to get him 2,000. But I, I'm with you. Um, I, I'm with you. I'm not with you. I still think 1,000 yards is, is big. But I think it's, it's because – but I think it's because teams have multiple guys now, and it's like, man, pick your poison. Let me ask you this. If Mike Evans never played another snap, is he a Hall of Famer? I got to go with yes. It doesn't feel like, like he is. Because he, he doesn't is. have the name value. Right. He, he's Mike Evans, but he's not Michael Irvin. He's not Ocho Senko. He's not, not Michael Jordan. How many Michael? Right. He's not. He's not on top of the Michael list. Not. Not. He's not a Michael. Yeah. Michael. He's Michael. He, sounds he's, like he's in trouble. He's not in trouble. He, yeah. He's a bland on paper, right? But think about it. He doesn't get in much trouble. He's it's, not he's like. He's, he's right. He's a right. He's like the the la, like. He's the best receiver that's not a diva at a diva position, and it's like an anomaly. You, you gotta love it. I mean, yeah, he's gonna have absolutely. He, he should have nine straight one thousand yard seasons. He has seventy eight career touchdowns. Here, here's a good uh, trivia. But but guess what? Listening. He's also got that championship, buddy. He's he got he's got he's got the ring, and he's, got he's continued to be productive. He goes into the Hall of Fame, and, and the only reason we'll disagree is because his name is Mike Evans. He's not flashy, right? He's not that guy. And really, it's the same thing for Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper's not flashy either. But I, I think his season takes off next season, Luke. That, that's when I think his season, his career, rejuvenates. I think if he gets Deshaun Watson for two or three seasons and he's healthy, he's got 1,000 yards every year, guaranteed. Mike Evans is number two on the active NFL receiving touchdown list. Who is number one? Hold on, hold on. Let, let me go through it. In my mind, it's. I'll give I'll give and, you time. Well, to think. I'm not going to tell I, you. No, no. I'm, I'm going to put it. I'm, I'm going between two guys that are active. I, it's it's Diggs or. Um uh, man. I feel like it's Diggs or Devontae. Those would be my two. Cooper Cup has come on late. And I don't think Cup's been in the league as long as Evans, Devontae, or Diggs. So to me, it's you, Diggs man. or Devontae. Really good guesses. Maybe one's right. But before I make you pick your final guess, and I'll give the audience another minute or two, there's three guys in this top 20 that I would give you 10 guesses and you probably wouldn't think of him, but then you're like, Oh yeah. Like he's been around. Number 20 is Mercedes Lewis. Who's been playing since. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he just caught one yesterday. Didn't he? No, no, no. <laughs> did he catch? No. Did he catch one yesterday? Mercedes Lewis has 38 career touchdowns. Um, Number 13, another tight end. Kyle Rudolph. The red zone killer. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Number 10, Randall Cobb. One more. That makes tons Number of sense. He's Yeah, because he's active. He's just hurt. Number eight, negative game script Nelly. Marvin Jones. <laughs> okay, okay. I can go, with, like, these are the old guys that are still active, still playing. I can get down with that. Number one, Devontae Adams. You nailed it. Yeah. H- had, to, had to be Adams or Diggs in my Stephon Diggs, number nine. Okay. We have Devontae. Who's, who's number three? Mike Evans, yeah, yeah. DeAndre Hopkins. Oh, I, you know what? I forgot about Nuke. He wasn't pl- it just out of sight, out of mind. Wasn't playing much this season. Just got back. If I would have thought about Nuke, I would have absolutely taken Nuke over Diggs. Absolutely. I'll run through the top 10 because I need to stop talking so much because we have to get out of here soon. Number four, yeah. A.J. Green. Number okay. five, yeah. Travis Kelsey. 
Yep. Six is Julio Jones. Seven, Tyreek Hill. Marvin Jones at eight. Diggs at nine. Wait Randall Cobb. What's the what's the gap between Tyreek and Julio? Julio is three ahead of Tyreek. Oh, Julio's dead. Julio's dead. Like, Julio may not catch another touchdown this season, and Tyreek's on the upswing. Like, if Tyreek, how many more years do you think? Last thing, because we got to get out, like you said. How many more years do you think Tyreek has? I think he's got at least another five, as long as he's not completely hurt. Five or six, like, really good season because of his speed. Three to five, yeah. Okay. So you think – so out of the five, I'm going to say he catches at least another 24 touchdowns. I'm going to give him eight a season. And I think that's very reasonable. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Anyway, number 11 is Amari Cooper. So another guy we just talked about. Yeah. On the- yeah. EPP food of the day and story time. We've been intertwining these lately, but what do you got for us, Chief? Uh, well, story time, it's – listen, it's, it's – it's basketball season. Uh, my son's back in the saddle. and I, th- I don't know if I talked about this last week, but I'm excited. He's playing varsity this year. He's in 10th grade. And uh, I was talking to him the other day. And I'm like, hey, man, you know how's practice going? He's like, hey, it's going fine. I said, so, uh, you know, what's it looking like? He's like, man, I'm, I'm running with the ones. I said, oh. I said, okay. Uh, you know, so, you know. Not saying it's official yet. He's going to start, obviously. But, you know, him running with the ones as a a sophomore, I think, is a big deal. And so I'm hoping that he continues to improve, get better. I don't think there's going to be anybody harder on that than I am just to help him keep keep himself together mentally and, uh, to you know, to just help him stay stay stable mentally for the season that's ahead because uh, this is first year playing varsity, obviously. And so I've already told him, look, man, Different speed, different level of competition. Got to be focused. Got to got to be prepared mentally. Don't go out there and make a bunch of mistakes, and you'll be fine. I'm parlaying that looch into the food of the day because with sports comes concessions. And let me just say that one of my favorite, my absolute favorite things to grab at any game. A chili cheese fries, my man. My gosh. Uh, I love chili cheese fries. And I don't want I don't want cheddar cheese melted over my fries, Luke. I want chili and the soft nacho cheese. Like that's what I want. I want that 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 salty. I want to eat my fries with a fork, right? I want the ooey gooey goodness of the cheese and the chili coming together. And the fries get a little soggy. Come on, you guys know what I'm talking about. I don't want cheddar cheese where I got to pull it and all the cheddar comes off in one fry. And you're like, now I just got fries again. There's no cheese. I want cheese sauce. I want chili. Can't wait to grab chili cheese fries from wherever your favorite concession stand is. Folks, it's going to be glorious. The high school auditorium concession stands, one of the only places where inflation really hasn't hit home. You can still get <laughs> you can still get a generous helping at a at a local friendly price of what say four seventy five or something, right? Like Yeah, because you know it's gotta be six. The, the, the local concession rate? stands. Oh, they need change. The high schools, the middle schools. <laughs> They'll nickel and dime you a little bit just to get that odd number because they need change in their drawer, right? But oh, what's the golden man. rate of chili cheese fries nowadays? And hey, let us know. Please, guys, let it tag this podcast if you're listening. We want to know this. What is the going rate for your local high school concession chili cheese fries? Please, please tag us with this. I will let you guys know next week because games are coming up now. He's got a game tomorrow, actually. Please let us know. I want to know this, Lutz. This is going to get very interesting. You know where they very get it? You, you know, they know where to sell you at the door because then you're leaving and then you always have someone, whether it's a faculty or maybe someone doing a fundraiser oh, or boy. the Boy Scout or the whatever. Then you just you have the candy bar table. The at world's the, finest chocolate. Yes. Yes, sir. 
at the yes. entrance exit of every sporting event, you have eight <laughs> to ten assorted candies, and you know damn well I'm buying one for a dollar, whatever it is. Yes, a dollar, absolutely. One dollar even. Oh. Candy's always an even round number. One dollar. And hot food, four seventy-five. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What a way to close out this podcast. We knew this podcast was going to be great. We're going to close it out with your local concession stand, non-inflated pricing, folks. It'll get any better than this. I want to tell you somewhere where I was this weekend, and maybe there's some listeners that were also there. I was at the Pennsylvania State Bacon Fest this My weekend. There was... I'm trying not to exaggerate. 150 different vendors there. It was in Easton, E A S T O N, like the bat, Pennsylvania. And they closed. It's a city, part of Lehigh Valley. I don't know, decent sized little mini city, I guess. And they closed down about, I don't know, six or seven blocks. And not all, not all the vendors were bacon related, but most of the menu had some kind of bacon. But it was all the best vendors and all their food trucks, since we know food trucks. I've really taken uh, the last decade by storm and there was everything you could imagine. Cheese steaks, cheese fries, bacon, everything. They were selling beer. There was restaurants selling beer, liquor, wine sampling. I did a shot and this wasn't good, but I did it, but I did a shot of maple bacon flavored bourbon just like because I had, I just felt obligated because it was calling my name, but it wasn't very good, but I feel like I had to do it. But Bacon Fest, oh, you're in a food coma just walking down the streets, my friend. I mean, every major vendor in probably the eastern half of Pennsylvania, some of New Jersey. Yeah. East kind of like on the border of New Jersey. I mean, that that was happening. If anybody was at Bacon Fest and there was live music all day, let me know. And if you're in the if you're in the Lehigh Valley, let's go get a bite to eat sometime. So I have something to talk about in my podcast. Anyway, yes, sir. don't forget the chili cheese fries prices. We want to know what the going rate is <laughs> for my guy, Will Priester. And I feel like we should say thanks to Aaron Rodgers because we talk about you all the time if you're listening. Thanks, Aaron. I'm, just, I'm Justin Carlucci. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Enjoy your week and good luck, everyone.